Hello and welcome to this next topic on OCR A-level chemistry. This is topic 37, which is chromatography and then qualitative analysis again. Now, some of these qualitative analysis tests we've seen quite a few times. Some of them are new for this qualitative analysis, but again, topic. What you can try is pause in the video and see if you can work out what you would add to test for each of these different functional groups. Okay, so let's go through. Alkenes, this is a GCSE one. You add bromine water and it decolorizes if it's an alkene. We now know the reason why it's electrophilic addition of the bromine to the double bond, but that decolorizes bromine water from orange. The next one is haloalkanes. Now, this is a little bit different to halides, but if you mix a haloalkane with aqueous silver nitrate solution and ethanol, if it makes a white precipitate, then it's a chloroalkane. If it makes a cream precipitate, then it is a bromoalkane. And if it makes a yellow precipitate, then it is an iodoalkane. You can also test all of those precipitates, so the silver chloride, the silver bromide, the silver iodide, with aqueous or concentrated ammonia. Obviously the chloride dissolves in aqueous ammonia, the silver bromide will dissolve in concentrated ammonia, as will the chloride, and then the silver iodide won't dissolve in any concentration of ammonia. You'll get that feeling that you're just repeating yourself. Next one's phenols, and now this one's a little bit new. I said in the aromatic compounds video that phenols are acidic but they're not acidic enough to make carbonate spheres. And so that's the test. They are acidic, they'll react with sodium hydroxide, for instance, but they won't make a carbonate spheres. As well as this, phenols will also decolorize bromine water. The next up is the carbonyls, so ketones, aldehydes. Those will react with 2,4-dinitrophenol hydrazine, 2,4-DNPH, to make an orange precipitate from a ready orange solution. And then from that precipitate, you can also work out which carbonyl it is by getting the melting point and then looking that up on a table of 2,4 DMPH derivative melting points. The next one up is aldehydes, that is the Tollens reagent silver mirror test. You add ammoniacal silver nitrate solution and if you get a silver mirror, which is a precipitate of silver metal, then that is an aldehyde. You have primary and secondary alcohols. For those, what you need to do is add acidified potassium dichromate, which is orange, and if it goes green, so that means that you've oxidized an alcohol and therefore reduced the dichromate to chromium 3 plus. And then the last one, carboxylic acids make carbonates fizz. The next thing we have to talk about is chromatography. And you do chromatography when you're in year seven with filter paper, pens and dyes, and then water. And this is very similar to that. Okay, so this is how paper chromatography works. I'm going to talk about paper chromatography so that that's simple and then I can make references to it with the other types of chromatography. So with paper chromatography, you normally do it with say, like a brown pen, like a brown felt tip pen. And you put the brown felt tip pen on a line, this is a piece of filter paper, and then you put the filter paper so that the water comes up to like just below this line. And as the water soaks up the paper, the different dyes will dissolve into the water. And depending on how soluble they are, then they'll go further up or lower down on the filter paper. So what you do is you just run the water up until it gets almost to the top. We call that the solvent front. And you end up with the dyes splitting, depending on their solubility, with different dyes at different points between where you started with them and right at the top. And so hopefully you can see that on the screen, but there are three dyes in my hypothetical ink. And so you've got the red, blue, and the green, and they're all separated out depending on how soluble they are in water. The more soluble they are, the further up they go, because they dissolve into the water and they absorb into the paper less. And so the technique is all about the relative solubility and the relative absorption into the paper of the different inks. So that separates them out. Now if I call the water the mobile phase because it's moving, and then the paper is the stationary phase, what we've done there is just described paper chromatography. And there's one thing we need to talk about which you don't do in year seven, normally, and that is the RF value. And the RF value is the fraction of the way up the paper or up to the solvent front that the ink made it. So the highest that each ink could get would be right to the top, as far up as the water went. That means that it's completely soluble in water and not at all absorbed onto the stationary phase. So the maximum is right at the top. The minimum, obviously, is it doesn't move at all, right at the bottom. And what we do is just describe that as a fraction of how far up it got. So if we measure the maximum it could have been, so to the solvent front, and then how far it actually got, so 
this distance between where it started and where the dot ended up. So you can calculate a fraction of just how far the dot got up compared to how far it could have gone. So for the green one, it would be, say, a third of the way up. This might be two-thirds of the way up, and then 90% of the way up. And you just give that as a fraction or a decimal or a percentage. They're all the same thing. And there's one other thing you can tell, and that is based upon the size of the dot. Now, it's not perfect. You can't do any real quantitative analysis of this. But you can see that bigger dots and smaller dots, that gives you an indication as to how much of that dye was in the ink to begin with. So that dye to begin with probably contained more red ink and less green ink. And then the blue dot is similar in size to the red. It doesn't tell you an actual percentage. It's not that good, but it does give you an indication. And so when you're drawing them, if you say you know it's 90% red and 10% green and there's no blue at all, then make sure that your red dot is bigger than your green dot. And so what I'll tell you all of this, paper chromatography isn't on the specification. But we do have thin layer chromatography and we do have gas chromatography. Now all I'm going to change is the mobile phase and the stationary phase. So for the mobile phase, that's the solvent. And if you do thin layer chromatography, it's still just the solvent that you use. And the stationary phase, instead of being paper, is a TLC plate, which is just aluminium with silica gel on it. The RF value is still calculated in exactly the same way. And so that's really all TLC is. Now the last one is gas chromatography. That works very similarly, but if you imagine allowing the water to just continue to flow up. So eventually the red one would reach the top, and then after that the blue one would reach the top, and then after that the green one would eventually get off the top. And if you measured how long it took, like the length of time it took, for the red one to come off, and the blue one to come off, and the green one to come off, then you could separate them that way. Instead of by how far up they got, it's how long it took for them to get to the top. And that's how gas chromatography works. It's got different mobile phase and stationary phase as well, as you'd expect, because it says gas chromatography, there's a gas. But it doesn't work by RF value, it works by retention time, which is the time it takes for that part of the sample to pass through completely the stationary phase. Now in terms of gas chromatography, the mobile phase is a gas. It's normally just an inert gas like helium, so it doesn't really interact with the gas all that much. But what it does is measure how much the sample interacts with the stationary phase. So essentially just imagine just blowing over it until it moves. That's essentially what gas chromatography is. It blows over it with helium and then kind of pushes it along the stationary phase. Now the stationary phase can be many different things. What we're measuring is basically the strength of the bond between the different parts of the sample and the stationary phase. And what you get after using gas chromatography is a graph that looks like this, a gas chromatogram. And you can see there are peaks those peaks are the constituents of the sample, and you can count how many there are, so there's three. You also get an indication as to the strength of the bonds they make. Obviously, the shorter amount of time, the less interaction it had with the stationary phase. So this one would have been like the red one, and then the middle one would have been the blue one, and then this one that took the longest to get out would have been the green one. And the same as with the size of these dots, you can also work out the relative amounts in the sample. So you can see there's more of this last one, there's a very small amount of the middle one, and then kind of an intermediate amount of this one. And if you measure the size of these peaks, so the area underneath each peak, then that gives you exactly how much of each part there was in the sample. So most simply, these questions will just ask you like, how many different compounds were in this sample, and hopefully it's obvious that that's three. Other times, they might ask which one's which, and so if you've got, say, a stationary phase which is polar, then the more polar molecules will take the longest to get out because the polar molecules and polar molecules interact the strongest and the polar molecules and non-polar molecules don't interact and so they come out quicker. And on the occasion, they'll ask you to order them. So you've got, say, four different things that ask you which one will come out first. And if you've got a polar solvent, then you just look to see which one's most polar. And if you look at the stationary phase, say you've got a stationary phase that can make hydrogen bonds, the molecule which makes the most hydrogen bonds is going to take the longest to get out, and the one that makes the fewest hydrogen bonds is going to take the shortest amount of time to come out. Those times, again, are called retention times. If they make about the same, so you've got two different esters, then they're probably going to take about the same amount of time to get out of the stationary phase, so they have very similar retention times, and so it's difficult to distinguish between two things which are very similar in their solubility, and those questions can come up too. And that is it for this topic of chromatography and qualitative analysis. Thank you very much for watching, and I hope you can join me for the next one, which is the last topic 
and spectroscopy. Goodbye.